Hello, once again, uh, welcome to the next uh, new episode of the PHP Singapore podcast recording. So with me today, we have on video chat, uh, Zion Ng, and we also have on text chat, Hui Ren Wu. <laughs> because Hui Ren has, uh, he's using his laptop, which has a faulty microphone, he can't really say as much. But uh, we can probably read, read his text on the screen. So if you're watching the, if you're listening to the audio podcast, uh, we'll just read out his comments on our, our chat window. And if once we publish the video, you can also see what he say. Uh, right, Ken. Hello everyone. So today we, uh, let's look at the stories we have lined up for today. So, so far we really have Unfortunately, <laughs> so we only have one story so far. Let me just look, just, just bring it up. Uh, where is it? Chrome, you can just share the browser. Yes, I can share the browser. And where is that story? I think it's Zion's. Right, can you see this? Ah, uh, yes. Let me just bring this over. Okay, cool. So, this is uh. Zion had a, wrote, a, wrote an article recently and then it's about uh, the three C's for coding, about consistency, context, and continuity. You want to share that? Okay, uh, Zion here. Okay, this one is going to be the shortest uh, podcast. <laughs> um, so recently, uh, I was doing some code review uh, on a colleague's uh, code. Um, kind of was kind of frustrated. So um, usually I try to emphasize on uh, code being maintainable. So uh, this is our rent out and uh, this uh, it ended up being becoming a blog post. So today I'm going to share about three C's for coding, uh, consistency, context, and continuity. So about five years ago, I actually wrote a post. It was titled 10% uh, development, 90% maintenance. So that was my view on software development and still is today. So basically it's um, when software development is 10% development, 90% maintenance. 10% of the time, you probably spend like, let's say one month working on the uh, project and probably you spend more than nine months uh, maintaining it. Um, yeah. So for example, let's say like Windows XP. Uh, Windows XP was released in 2001 and it still accounts for more than ten percent, uh, like a few about uh, five years ago. So that's more than ninety percent maintenance, really. So I was thinking of coming out with a easy and simple way to communicate my my requirement for clean and maintainable code to both developers and to my colleagues in uh, the business team. So the first C, consistency. So consistency basically maintains our uh, focus mainly on coding style and standards. So if your code is written consistently and you have a consistent directory structure, you have a consistent way of naming the variables and the classes, right? It makes life easier for everyone and it wastes less time for each and everyone. So uh, for each C, I will actually share three points. So first point for first thing, consistency reduces cognitive friction. It means you don't get brain freeze when you're looking at code. So suppose let's say you have a newspaper in front of you and you're trying to read it, but there's a lot of grammatical and spelling mistake. Uh, no paragraphing, there's a lot of missing spaces, wrong punctuation, and there's a mix of British and American English you'll probably be too hung up by the errors to focus on the article itself. So uh, in the article, I actually show a sample code, a negative example of this uh, in the gray box. So in this case, you see a sample code, uh, the if statements. So the first if statement, there's a space after the opening the bracket, but for the second if statement, there's no uh, space after the opening bracket. The uh, first if statement uses the normal comparison. The second if statement uh, uses the uh, Yoda condition. So like value equal equals uh, variable. The first if statement 
does not enclose its code in uh, braces. So actually, if you read a long piece of code, right, you might get uh, confused. Okay? This console.log1, right, does it actually belong to uh, 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 the first if statement or the second if statement? Uh, the indentation is also not consistent. So probably you'll be too hung up trying to figure out how to read this code in, uh, and you waste actually, actually a lot of times. Uh, second sub point, consistency allows easier search and replace. For example, if you are consistently naming variables uh, using camel case, uh, and I say I don't look for something, let's say, related to person ID. So I'll just look for small letter person, capital I and D, person ID, and not variations like person underscore ID, uh, capital person ID, person in small letters, ID in capital letter, or with a hyphen. Or even try to come up with a regular expression uh, pattern to, uh, to do the searching. So this is for searching. Replacing will be another beast. The uh, third sub point, consistency helps to reduce guesswork when modifying or adding, editing, uh, adding code. So for the sample API response below in the JSON format, so now it's a great help for us to see the screen. Right? You see, uh, if I want to name a new key related to a person ID, so uh, how, how, what will I name a new key? So if you look at the sample API response, right? The key got used camel case, la, snake case, Pascal case, kebab case, caps case, and found funny case. So in this case, right, then you have to go and call the, what, call the developer, say, hey, so actually how, uh, what case do I use? Uh, waste of time. Okay, now uh, come to the second C, which is context. Now, uh, code, source code will tell you the how, but context will tell you the why. Okay, so she has say what's the background story, uh, what's uh, the uh, rationale behind this code. So it helps other people to understand the rationale behind. So for example, let's say you onboard a new developer. He come in, and this line of code is actually redundant, I think, so I delete it. But it turns out that affects some obscure logic spread across 10 other files in five different folders. So for this second C context, again, I have three sub points, consistency, right? Three sub points. <laughs> First sub point, context can pre pre uh, be preserved via dot blocks. So dot blocks are basically, especially for meta comments, they use annotations to document specific segments of code. Typically, uh, variables, function, and classes. So, for example, uh, for JavaScript, there's JS doc, uh, PHP users, uh, PHP documenter, and uh, you sometimes can use API doc for documenting REST APIs. So, in this gray color box that you see in the middle of the screen right now, uh, there are two functions. The first function has no doc block, no documentation block. It's just called function Z and it takes into meta parameters called Q and R. So imagine, let's say the function is 1000 lines. And you try, imagine try reading 1000 lines to try to understand what the function does. And imagine doing this every time you come back to this piece of code because you can't remember what you understood three months ago when you read this piece of code. Now we come to the second function below. There's a, it's called compute height. Okay. Good name, okay. Yes, a uh, 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 name that gives a context. Uh, it has a properly named method parameters with an expect ratio, and there's a dot block, a documentation block. So a summary: this function compute a high based on expect ratio. It takes in two parameters. First parameter is a float. Second parameter is a float, and you return a float. So simple, short and sweet. You don't need to read through 1,000 lines. You can just know what does this function does based on the dot plot itself. Okay, so you can save like hours of the time. Second sub point. 
context can be preserved by comments. So the first are normally just document a summary of a variable function or class. But comments can be sprinkled everywhere. So as I said just now, when the developer looks at the source code, he understands the what and the, and the how. How this is being done, how to calculate prime numbers. But comments will tell the why, the rationale, uh, the logic behind this for loop. Or say that this piece of code is linked to a GI issue. Uh, this is to solve a certain bug. There's a certain uh, edge case to uh, this is solving. So in this piece of code, uh, the gray box in the middle of the screen uh, is basically uh, you see two comments: Jira ticket one two three. Uh, this event is now but keep full screen change. It's located for Mac OS Safari. Because WebKit and full screen doesn't work. And then uh, you must add the listening, listener of the video element itself, not the document. Whereas for a normal full screen change, you need to add the listener on the document itself. So two lines of comments. So don't always assume that the developer looking at this is an expert on full screen. Okay, so instead of uh, wasting time to look at the Mozilla docs, so these two comments explain everything, save time. Now, the start point. Now, probably I can start, start talking in Chinese after drinking this. Uh. <laughs> okay, the start point. Context can be preserved by documentation. When I say documentation, I'm not talking about Microsoft Word files or Google Doc files or GitHub wikis or PDF. Be because all these things installation are special, you need to either install Microsoft Word to read a Word document. You probably need a Google Drive account, a G company Gmail account to read the Google Docs. And when the person leaves the company, right, they will normally suspend or delete that person's account. So the creator who originally created the documentation has left the company. And because the company suspends the account, you lose the access to the document forever. Uh, and they are stored separately from the code. So for example, GitHub wikis. So supposing one day I move to Bitbucket or GitLab, what happens to the wiki? Will someone actually remember to port everything over? Most of the time, actually, no. So when I say documentation, I'm referring to plain text files written in markdown format. They are committed with the source code in the same repository. Wherever the repository goes, wherever the source code goes, the markdown files will go together with it. And because it's text based, so you can just view it or edit it using a normal text editor. Uh, and you can actually track the changes in the document as well. I guess so, that's, that's also in line with like keeping your like document or comments as close to the to the code itself. I think that's uh, the yes, principle. Yes. Correct. Mm. So which is, so the examples would be the standard readme and the changelog.md open source projects. So over here, there's a sample readme summary. How do you install? How do you deploy? Um, now, sometimes uh, we kind of take things for granted. I see a lot of projects, right, where they don't have a uh, readme. And even if they have a readme, they don't have an installation section. Now, you may say that, hey, it's a front-end project. So I see one package.json, right? Automatically, I just run npm install. Uh, but there may be certain caveats. So usually in my readme, I will have an installation section. Uh, deployment also. Some people say, um, I using CI what? The Travis CI YAML file is already in the repo, or I using Bitbucket pipelines. But uh, it always helps to explain uh, plain English. Okay, project is deployed via Bitbucket pipelines. The files are uploaded to S3 and served via uh, CloudFront. And then uh, normally after upload, they will actually 
uh, clear the cache. And let's say on the CDN side, you need to set certain response headers. All these are not done in the CI file. These are normally done once and forget about it. But for example, let's say you switch your CDN provider or uh, say S3 or anything, right? You need to set up from scratch. So who actually remember all these caveats? Say you must set the uh, cash expiry to one hour. You must set the uh, cost policy, things like that. Yeah. So normally I will actually have this in my, uh, my deployment session. Workflow. Uh, previously, I came across this project, uh, this video play, uh, project. It took me three days to look through the whole code just to get a sense of how the general workflow works like. I don't look through every single file. So over here in the readme, for my readme, I normally have a workflow like uh, how the code goes from uh, end to end. The same for the clients, your browser, all the way to the back end and all the way back. The, the rough workflow. Okay, now we come to the third C, which is the last C, uh, continuity. So continuity aims to make handovers more smooth, easier, and complete. So continuity largely involves the imparting of institutional knowledge. There's only so much that you can actually uh, tell someone in the one hour handover session. This also board, this also triggers down when uh, you have code that has a poorly designed architecture or an overly convoluted workflow. For example, let's say the previous project I was talking about, you also convoluted this one, call this one, this one, call this one, there's an expression on top of this one, just to make it work nice with TypeScript and everything. Uh, in the end, it took me three days to actually try to uh, understand the uh, simple, uh, how to, the simple workflow of the project. So, uh, for example, let's say like, uh, when was the last time you saw an iPad ship with an instruction manual? Actually, you don't have. Because you try to make it simple. Yes, simple enough user interface. Of course, uh, some video advertisements will have also. So, make it so simple that when people look at it, they can easily trace uh, the workflow and the architecture. So, we remember the KISS principle, keep it simple and stupid. So third C, continuity, also has three sub points because consistent, consistency. First sub point, continuity involves increasing the bus factor. The bus factor refers to the number, the minimum number of developers working on a project that will get knocked down by a bus. Yes, your bus as in your public transport before the project comes to a complete halt. If the project has a bus factor of one, all the domain knowledge is stored in a single Okay, um, second sub point. Can you hear me? Just a check. Okay. Yeah, because I Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so second sub point, continuity involves human resources. So unlike our grandparents era, the employees nowadays seldom work for a company for life. When I say life, I mean decades. Uh, and that's even if the company can last that long. So for example, like my mom, she worked for the, uh, this logistic company for 17 years, one seven. So like normally now, this are after three to five years, or you get a long service awarding. So even if you stay in the same company for many years, you may not be assigned to a project for life either. So simply put, uh, not many of us will have the luxury of walking down the corridor and ask uh, a big developer 
on this piece of code. Hey, uncle, you wrote this piece of code 50 years ago. Can you help me explain uh, this part? Uh, we don't have the luxury anymore. In my, now, uh, I can't remember which country is it. They are asking for Kogo developers. Uh, because they are having an influx of uh, requests and their main phase is running Kobo. So where are the Kobo developers? Don't know. Okay, the original one. Uh. Okay. Last point, the third sub point of continuity involves professionalism. So this one cuts across all trades. Okay, you see the road sweeper, right? Whether raining or shining or there's a haze, he will diligently sweep the road. And then the hawker, uh, tomorrow was uh, everyone will be taking uh, take away, right? He will cook every plate of food to exact standards. He won't say that uh now less customer, uh, I just put less effort, uh, anyhow cook. Uh, no. Uh proper hawker with, uh, pro with professionalism, with a professional attitude, will always cook each plate properly to exact standards. Then come to the hotel. Let's say there's a front desk manager. This customer can slap him for no right reason to vent his anger. The front desk manager still serve him with a smile. So that is called professionalism. So basically, we are paid by our company to do our job. Even if let's say we have our own company, right? Uh, we are being paid by our clients. Uh, so it behoves us therefore to do our level best despite emotions and to ensure that our code can be easily maintained even after we have left the company. So don't burn the bridge, always live on good terms. So that covers all the three things, consistency, context, and continuity. And frankly speaking, actually all these are tied in, bound by a common D, discipline. Because uh, frankly speaking, if you don't have discipline, it's a bit hard to actually uh, do all this. But uh, that'll be another topic for another day. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Sure, that sounds really cool. Thanks. So I think a, a couple of comments. I think this uh, Huiren actually shared some things. So the one he shared that I think he's, he's uh, targeting the first part about being about consistency, right? <laughs> so in, in sense of consistency, you could actually use something like instead of like enforcing it uh, in in terms of like talking about it and whatnot, you have a a system in place to help introduce this uh, introduce some of this um, so introduce some of this uh, uh, discipline right so some of the disciplines uh, that you talk about so instead of having making it a uh, uh, a human factor you make it more like the system will take care of it so basically you introduce some things like uh, uh, JSON API for example there's one way of like introducing some form of like uh, syntax uh, for the J for JSON, he also talked about another thing called Hell, uh, which which is also a way of like standardizing how things should talk to each other. So I think it's it's it's, it's basically hypermedia la. hypermedia and ah, uh, yes. is hypermedia to do that. And then the last one, he so other than using these uh, two techniques, I also uh, I also recommend something like PHP Lint. Uh, which is probably kind of like close to JS Lint and uh, JS Hint, which is kind of like a way of like helping you uh, having some system in place like in that will help you clean up your code or even warn you of like badly formatted code, uh, right? So in the in sense that you want to enforce a certain PSR uh, formatting standard, you can use uh, you could use something like this instead of like making it a. Uh, Instead of making it like, oh, you know, it's such a chore to actually format it correctly, you make it part of your workflow, right? Once it becomes part of the workflow as a nat natural, uh, as a natural uh, consequence uh, to what your work daily workflow is, then it wouldn't be so much of a chore, right? Because like enforcing consist uh, consistency and, and, and all that stuff can be a bit of a, of a hassle. Uh, so on the second C, I think he also talked about, when he talked about context, uh, I think uh, Huiren also talked about this thing called uh, f uh, function length. I think was this really was this related to the function length? Uh, rather, the was this function length related to this one? I can't remember. Yeah, they probably saying that uh, if it's too long, it probably is a bit hard to dig, dig through. Yeah, I think if Martin Fowler has a uh, read lot of articles uh, in, in in respect to all these things, uh, uh, or like how to write good code and all that stuff. 
and yeah, having context like this, uh, yeah, look, uh, introducing context using uh, documents. Long methods are usually not, not a good thing to, to have anyway. Um, there's, uh, there's this Ruby developer called uh, Sandy Metz. She also had this uh, thing called the five rules. She has a couple of rules that she set up, right? So maybe we can share with you. Sandy Metz rules. So it's kind of an interesting series of, uh, of rules for developers. So you could also try something like this. And number one is uh, classes are no longer than 100 lines of code. Methods are no longer than five lines of code. Oh, wow. Okay. Pass no more than four parameters into a method. A uh, hash as in uh, associative, uh, associative array uh, as uh, uh, options are also parameters. So just, just be mindful. Uh, I think in this case, she was talking about controllers as in controllers can initialize and instantiate only one object. Therefore, views can only uh, know about one instance variable and views should only... Uh, so it's kind of in the, in the context of MVC framework where you pass something from controller into the view, make it just one object and then have somehow. So she, she kind of like uh, wrote down this couple of rules as a way of like, because she was working with a team and the team was also very, a lot of very inconsistent and very like, they wrote very long functions and all that stuff and a lot of uh, very inconsistent way of doing things. So she kind of like put her feet down and say, hey, let's try this. Um, now, so in this way, it kind of forces them to think about smaller functions, smaller code, smaller classes, so that it's easier to understand and easier to, rec to recognize. So there's also one way you can think about it, uh, having rules and everything. In context, uh, well, uh, I have a comment about context. Uh, comments is a very, not very good way of uh, documenting things. Uh, if it's important enough, so it's like my my view is like comments. Once you see too many of it, you you become like um, white noise. You don't really care about it anymore. If there's too much comments, you don't really care about it. Although having a doc block like this, of course, is helpful for your IDE to 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 hint uh, things. So this is actually kind of like you you like writing code here anyway. Um, but for comments like this, I mean, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah. So. so I think if you is uh, if you flip it around and say you have no comments in your code, and when a comment appears, it becomes a bit more like oh wow, there's a, there's a comment here right now. But be careful what it, what's what it's all about, because if you're too liberal with your commenting, it becomes uh, people just bypass it or, or don't look at it. And we so when you don't use uh, comments, you got to think about other ways of doing it, which which is for example writing more fun uh, giving your functions a bit more helpful or easy to understand names. Uh, that's one way. Naming your variables are, are better. Uh, even organizing your code in a way that you, you would actually read your functions and the components and, and all those things you're passing, read like. It, it, it introduce, or rather, it, it kind of tells you the intent when you look at the function of the, of the uh, name of the function, the variables that pass it, the arguments that pass it. All this kind of tells you an intent. And the intent is, is obvious by looking at how the, fu how the, fu how the function names and the variables and arguments are, are called. Right? So there's one of the ways, I think that's where, where, that's where naming things are well are, are, is very important so that it's easier to... So you don't, instead of using comments to tell you the intent, you use your functions to, to, to surface the intent. Right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's another way of doing it. Um, and of course, documentation like this is very invaluable. La. And even like we were, for example, for word deployment, right? And we even go as far as saying, hey, you should probably use, uh, de uh, infra as code, or even some form of deployment ah, code, yeah. right? So in some in some in a project, uh, in a talk I I, I saw recently, uh, which they talk they talk about how to reduce complexity in terms of like microservices. So what they do is that all the different microservices have the, a common make file. So all of them have have make files. And in the make file, you can just make build or make make deploy or whatever. So basically, there's a, a standard syntax. Uh, they use you use make something make build means you're building the binary. Make deploy means you're actually deploying deploying the binary, right? So across all your microservices, you have the same syntax, and it actually makes it a lot easier uh, when you context switch between different microservices. But I guess that's a microservice called architecture, lah. But you it could also be relevant if you will have uh, if you have many projects in your in your in your infrastructure a lot of, like legacy code new code and whatever so all these separate smaller monoliths yes my cat is calling me i'm <laughs> yes. sorry my cat is outside he's trying to get in um 
Sorry. So anyway, so yeah, um, long function. Uh, so yeah, so having uh, uh, infrared as code could also be a way of like just reducing the number of uh, amount, amount of documentation you need to have. Uh, Huiren also mentioned something about uh, he also put a plus one on linters. Uh, so linters are also good. Uh, yep, too long fun too long methods you will just ignore for those who are inherited, uh, in interested in using. So for those who are interested in using JSON API for Laravel, there's also a. Uh, he say he's been using it for a year. So he's using this library called uh, Laravel JSON API. So if you're interested in using uh, Laravel. Uh, 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 like JSON API in Laravel. There's actually a, a, a library for that. Okay, interesting. Okay, unfortunately, the we uh, you don't have a uh, and can't be you don't have any uh, voice right now, so yeah, uh, can't be, can't hear him. But yes, my cat has a voice, so I don't know. Okay, fine. Let me just let the cat in. Sorry. Now. Hello. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Thanks. That's a very interesting article. And how? Uh, when you publish this? Uh, just a few days ago, is it? Uh. Oh, is it last? Uh, twenty four. Twenty four. Uh, okay. Cool. Still quite recent. Yeah. Well, one. Uh, yeah, two weeks ago. So also one thing I find that. Uh, a lot of times when I see handovers, right, the, uh, then they'll do a last minute documentation uh, near to uh, one month before they leave. Um, where else, right, um, this sort of things, like, documentation actually should be done like bit by bit so that it's not like one whole shot because uh, after some time like, you forget, like, hey, actually how is this thing deployed, uh, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Talking about documentation, there's also this some other thing. One other thing that we that I, that I like to use is called lightweight ADR. Uh, okay, ADR stands for Architecture Decision Record. So, oh. uh, lightweight ADR. So you know you will find this uh, being talked about in the ThoughtWorks uh, technology radar. So if you are not familiar with it, the ThoughtWorks Tech Radar is actually a uh, kind of like a quarterly magazine that ThoughtWorks uh, publish where they give an overview of like what are the different technologies that you should look out for upcoming stuff and all that so lightweight ADR was something that they talked about in one, in one of their uh, te technology radar like some years ago and they, they have written it down as this something you should adopt uh, so which is very interesting so basically ADR is, bas uh, is basically ADR is like an architecture decision, decision record so you could use a markdown file, which whenever you come to a decision about some technology stack or whatever, right? Then you could use uh, ADR to kind of document. This is why we do uh, like why we're doing it, and this is the this is the this, uh, the context in which it, it makes sense to use it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's so one of those ways, and you can use. There's also a ADR um, command line tool. So ADR command line tool basically lets you ADR tools. So it lets you create uh, using a command line to create like uh, markdown records in your in your uh, in your repository. So like in, in ADR init like something like this. Then you say ADR I'm implementing some new stuff, and then uh, it, will, it will tell you. Then you can basically go inside there. So it creates a markdown file like, which is a certain format. So it's kind of interesting, and uh, it links to. Right, so it actually links to Michael Nygaard's article on this subject. So yeah, so Michael Nygaard is a uh, quite a prolific uh, uh, author in this area, and then he wrote an article about this as well, documenting architecture decisions. So it's actually one of the ways that you can, you know, as a lightweight way. Of, like I'm also practicing this in my company right now. So as in, whenever they come up with a decision, um, they come up with whenever they come up with a decision about. Uh, some technology to use or why we uh, write our code a certain way we just uh, make sure we, we write a new document about it and it's taking a while to load this document anyway yeah but this is uh, one of the cool things uh, in the industry uh, so you should check it out cool cool, cool. anything else uh, anything else from Puyren anything else to share 
Cool. You will start. Yeah, you will share on the next po- he will share on the next uh, podcast. Yeah, so he will share a bit more about his about it, about new things in his uh ne- next podcast. So, uh, right here. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> can can. So yeah, uh, from all of us here at uh, PHP Singapore podcast. Uh, that's Huirin and Zion and myself. Uh, that's all we have. Anything? Uh, any new updates or changes on your end, Zion? Mm, not really. Uh, yeah, just got new uh, VP Engineering and uh, new uh, front, uh, front end developer uh, on our side. So cool. we're doing all the onboarding. Nice, nice. So on my side, I've just started working from home. As you can see, I'm at home now with my cat over here. And then. Show us cat. Uh, sure. yeah. Do right away. Uh, hello. He's not very happy doing this. Meow. 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 <laughs> okay. Can drive now. And Huirin is probably going to take his exam soon. So online on, on online exam, huh? Even though <laughs> well, <laughs> there's been an announcement that media exams uh, in Singapore are kind of cancelled. In in lieu of uh COVID, because of COVID nineteen, so but he said he has still have to take his exams online. So unfortunately for you, com science ma, I don't must work hard. Okay, work hard. Don't play so much. Ken. Uh, cool. So that's uh that's all we have for the, for this uh, month's uh, podcast. So I uh, hope to see you all next again next year uh, next month. And we can chat more. All right, cool. Okay, bye. Okay, see ya. Yeah.